campaign rallies and events in battleground states and watch coverage of key state races, including over 125 House, Senate, and Governor debates from all across the country. The 2004 campaign this fall, prime time on weeknights, over the weekend, and every Sunday, road to the White House at 6.30 and 9.30 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice talked about American relations with the Muslim community today in a speech at the campus of Wingate University in Thank North Carolina. Much. Thank you. The event's 45 Thank you. minutes. Thank you very, very much. It's great to be home here in the South. Uh, I just spent a little time over at Johnson C. Smith University where my dad was actually both a collegian and a seminarian. And uh, it's just wonderful to be here. And it's uh, great to be in North Carolina, and it's really great to be here at the Jesse Helm Center. This center is a fitting monument to the legacy of my friend, Senator Jesse Helms, to his long tenure on the Senate, uh, in the Senate and as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and his unshakable dedication to the principles of liberty and democracy and free enterprise. Senator Helms was always willing to work on the hardest of issues, sometimes bridging divides over issues like NATO expansion and United Nations reform to further American interests. Senator, we're in your debt for your service. Thank you. <laughs> to Mrs. Helms, to Art Pope, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Congressman Hayes, uh, I think who is uh, somewhere here, but thank you, Robin, for the uh, wonderful invocation. To Dr. Jerry McGee, the president of this fine university, John Dodd, the president of the Jesse Helm Center, distinguished guests and especially students, I'm delighted to have a chance to spend a few minutes talking about uh, one of the challenges of our time. In the comprehensive report of the 9-11 Commission, there was a call for the United States to develop a long-range strategy to engage in the struggle of ideas to defeat Islamic terrorism. That report said that we must have a strategy that is political as much as it is military, and that long-term success demands the use of all elements of American national power, diplomacy, intelligence, law enforcement, covert action, economic policy, foreign aid, public diplomacy, and homeland defense. President Bush and the members of his administration could not agree more. Since the beginning of the War on Terror, president, the President has recognized that the War on Terror is as much a conflict of visions as it is a conflict of arms. One terrorist put it succinctly, you love life, we love death, he said. True victory will come not merely when the terrorists are defeated by force, but when the ideology of death is overcome by the appeal of life and hope, and when lies are replaced by truth. This has been the President's clear message and consistent practice. In his very first State of the Union speech, he said, we have a great opportunity during this time of war to lead the world toward the values that bring lasting peace. America will take the side of brave men and women who advocate these values around the world, including in the Islamic world, because we have a greater objective than just eliminating terrorist, terrorism and containing resentment. We seek a just and peaceful world beyond the war on terror. The President has put these words into action. Under his leadership, America has adopted a forward strategy of freedom for the Middle East. That strategy has many elements. We are supporting the people of Afghanistan and Iraq as they fight terrorists and extremists and as they work to build democratic governments. We have joined with our NATO and G8 allies to help the people of the broader Middle East and North Africa to create jobs and increase access to capital, improve literacy and education, protect human rights, and make progress toward democracy. President Bush has launched the Middle East Partnership Initiative to link America with reformers in the Middle East through cooperative projects. He is working to establish a U.S. Middle East free trade area within a decade to bring the people of the region into an expanding circle of opportunity. And just this week, he signed America's newest free trade agreement with the Kingdom of Morocco. 
His latest budgets double funding for the National Endowment for Democracy with its new work focusing on bringing free elections, free markets, free press, free speech, and free labor unions to the Middle East. And under the President's leadership, we are increasing our support to broadcasting efforts in the Middle East by one-third, from 30 to 40 million dollars. Early in the administration, we began successful Arabic language Radio Sawa and Persian language Radio Farda. And this year, we launched a new Middle East television network called Al Hura, Arabic for the free one. The network broadcasts news and movies and sports and entertainment and educational programming to millions of people across the region. We can and we must do more. Our future efforts should focus on two areas. First, we must work to dispel destructive myths about American society and U.S. policy. Second, we must expand our efforts to support and encourage the voices of moderation and tolerance and pluralism in the Muslim world. In the immediate aftermath of September 11th, many Americans asked, why do they hate us? It was even the title of a celebrated Newsweek cover story. Then as now, the answer to the question is, it depends on whom is meant by they. There's a small minority of extremists in the Muslim world who indeed do hate America. They hate our policies, they hate our values, they hate our freedoms, they hate our very way of life. When that hatred is, is, is expressed through terrorist violence, there is only one proper response. We must find and defeat those who seek to kill our people and harm our country. Yet, there are some one billion people in this world who profess the Islamic faith. And the evidence about their attitudes toward the United States is far from conclusive. A great many Muslims still come to this country every year in search of a better life. And surveys show that many more would if they could. Yet surveys of Muslim populations also show that large majorities of Muslims fear American power or mistrust American intentions or misunderstand our values. For instance, many in the Muslim world see the worst of our popular culture, something that we ourselves see. And they assume that American-style democracy or any democracy at all inevitably has to lead to crassness and immorality. Others believe that democracy is inherently hostile to faith and corrosive of cherished traditions. And many others are fed a steady diet of hateful propaganda and conspiracy theories that twist American policy into grotesque caricatures. Now these views pose a serious challenge for our country. At their worst and most intense, they create a climate of bitterness and grievance in which extremism finds sympathetic ears. And such views can hold whole societies captive to failed ideologies and prevent many millions of people from joining the progress and prosperity of our times. The consequences for much of the Muslim world are stagnation, persistent poverty, and a lack of freedom. Dispelling these myths and instilling trust will be difficult. We must not lose sight of the fact that some of the mistrust and suspicion felt toward the West has some basis in reality. Relations between the Islamic world and the West began in conflict. And for many centuries, bitter and bloody conflict, wars of religion and then colonial wars, defined the contact that each society had with the other. And for the last six decades, as President Bush has noted, America and our allies excused and accommodated the lack of freedom in the Middle East, hoping, as the President put it, to purchase stability at the price of liberty. Of course, we got neither. Yet, of course, this is far from the whole story. The story of America's recent relations with the Muslim world is a story of friendship and partnership. Turkey is a strong ally of the United States and a full and proud member of the NATO alliance. 
America has also built alliances with Muslim nations around the world, from Morocco to Indonesia. We have signed free trade agreements with Muslim nations and are working on others. We are a major provider of development assistance to poor Muslim nations. And America has taken the side of the Palestinian people who are seeking democracy and reform. This is probably the greatest misunderstanding of all. President Bush is the first American president to call for a Palestinian state. Yet, because America supports Israel's desire for security, many in the Muslim world believe that America opposes the Palestinian desire for freedom. But in truth, our policy insists on freedom. The president believes that the Palestinian people deserve not merely their own state, but a just and democratic state that serves their interests and fulfills their decent aspirations. For its part, Israel must meet its responsibilities and help create conditions for a democratic Palestinian state to emerge. It must take steps to improve the lives of the Palestinian people and to remove the daily humiliations that harden the hearts of future generations. Along with the vast majority of people who dwell in the Holy Land, Americans want that region to live in peace. The story of America's recent relations with the Muslim world is also one of help, even rescue. American soldiers gave their lives trying to provide food in Somalia. America has gone to war five times since the end of the Cold War, and how many in the Muslim world know that each time it was to help Muslims. Americans have fought in Kuwait and in Bosnia and in Kosovo and in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And without exception, these were wars of liberation and freedom. Kuwait's sovereignty was restored, and today the monarchy is pursuing reforms. Kuwait has a directly elected National Assembly. America stopped the killing in Bosnia and reversed ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. Today, those two nations are making the tough reforms needed so that they can join with a united Europe. Afghanistan is free of brutal repression of the Taliban and building a democracy that recognizes the central role of Islam in its life. Iraq is free of the terror and the fear of Saddam's rule. Iraqis are free to worship as they choose. Major religious shrines are open to pilgrims for the first time in decades. And the Iraqi people are building a real democracy. These are stories that have to be told and that need to be heard. So does the truth about American society. From a distance, American society can seem secular and commercial and hectic and hypermodern and dismissive of tradition. Yet Americans, of course, have a profound respect for our traditions, a deeply felt sense of justice, and a strong attachment to our communities. And survey after survey shows that Americans are by far the most religious people in the developed world. The American Constitution and the American way of life strike a successful balance between the imperatives of government and the demands of conscience. Since our founding, we have separated church and state, but we do not exclude religion from the public square. In fact, among all modern societies in the world, America is the one in which religion and religious people play the largest role. In America, there is no conflict between being a good Jew or Christian or Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim. Many Muslims born in other lands have learned this for themselves as they pray in America's 1,200 mosques and raise their children in the Islamic faith, their American children in the Islamic faith. Yet we cannot take for granted that Muslims in the rest of the world know these simple truths about us. We need to get these truths about our values and our policies to the people of the Middle East because truth always serves the cause of freedom. To achieve this goal, the President has directed the State Department, along with the United States uh, Aid and other agencies, to expand exchange programs for American and Muslim youth. Education is the ladder through which people realize their aspirations. Education is transforming. At a minimum, education imparts knowledge and expands a person's horizons. At its best, 
education can wipe away the differences of circumstance and of birth and the confines of class. There is a proud and profound tradition of learning and literature and science in the Muslim world. Yet in that part of the world today, schools too often preach hate and intolerance, and girls are often denied the chance to go to school at all. And so we must work with partners in the region to improve educational opportunities and quality at all levels from grade school through universities. We will also reach out to local media to provide training, to help professionalize news reporting, and to share our side of the story. We must do everything that we can to support and encourage the voices of moderation and tolerance and pluralism in the Middle East. There is a hunger for new ideas and fresh thinking in the broader Middle East. The great struggle of ideas of our time is not a struggle between the West and the Islamic world, but a struggle within the Islamic world. A great and sometimes anguished debate is underway throughout the broader Middle East and all of the nations of the Islamic world, a debate about the future of Islam, the role of religion and politics in education, and the use of Islam by terrorists to justify their violent acts. In the wake of the Beslan massacre, many commentators and intellectuals watching those horrible events in Russia have been especially blunt for the need for change. Last week in the Saudi daily Okaz, columnist Khalid Hamad al Suleiman wrote, the time has come for Muslims to be the first to come out against those interested in abducting Islam in the same way they abducted innocent children. This is the true jihad these days, and this is our obligation as believing Muslims toward our monotheistic religion. Now, we are fully aware that sometimes outside support can be as harmful as it is helpful. Some critics in the Muslim world will point to aid from the West as a way to delegitimize reformist ideas. We're thinking hard about how moderate and democratic forces <clears throat> in the West can usefully help those in the Islamic world fighting against extremism because they need our help. Today, outside support for extremists is common. While moderates too often struggle with inadequate resources and too little solidarity, that has to change and we must change it. America will seek partners in the Muslim world who can guide us and assist us in this work and tell us how we can help them to accomplish it. Those partners will be found among government officials and moderate clerics and scholars and business leaders, non-governmental officials, and throughout Muslim societies. Together, we will work to support efforts that other Muslim countries and leaders have already undertaken to support indigenous moderate Islamic scholarship, to sustain improvements in school systems, to develop independent publications, to protect the rights of women and minorities, and to support charities committed to economic, social, and democratic reform. Student exchanges and sister city programs in professional contexts help forge lasting ties of friendship. They did so during the Cold War across the Atlantic. They can do so again. Americans also need to hear the stories of the people of the Muslim world. We need to understand their challenges and their cultures and their hopes. Our interaction has to be a conversation, not a monologue. We must reach out to explain, but also to listen. And this is not a task for the American government alone. Our nation needs the help of all of our citizens, of our schools and our universities, People like you, universities, people who through their non-governmental institutions contact people of the world, people who through their interactions in commerce contact the people of the world, are a part of the brigades that must tell that story. All of these efforts began from a simple principle. America is taking the side of millions of people in the Muslim world who long for freedom, who cherish learning and progress, and who seek economic opportunity for themselves and for their children. If history has taught us anything, it is that these are universal aspirations. 
Their realization can be delayed by tyranny or corruption or stagnation, but they cannot be indefinitely denied. People will not tolerate arbitrary or artificial limits on their hopes forever. As we speak, the momentum of freedom is building in the broader Middle East, at Alexandria and Istanbul and the Dead Sea and Sanaa and Aqaba. Political, civil society and business leaders have met in the last year to discuss modernization and reform and have issued stirring calls for political and economic and social change. Now there will always be cynics who deride freedom and democracy as dangerous foreign imports, just as there are cynics here at home who allege that Arabs or Muslims aren't somehow interested in freedom or perhaps aren't ready for freedom's responsibilities. Yet time and truth are on the side of liberty. That terrible thing that there were those who were not interested in freedom or couldn't accept freedom's responsibility has been said at some point in time about just about every group of peoples in the world. It was said at one time about Germans. It was said about Russians. It was said about Asians, it was said about Africans, it was said about Latin Americans, and frankly, in our own history, it was said about people who were like me, descendants of slaves. In every case, it has been demonstrated that these are aspirations that are universal and that given a chance, men and women will embrace freedom, not tyranny. The September 11th Commission's report has it exactly right. Our strategy must be comprehensive because the challenge we face is greater and more complex than just a threat. The victory of freedom in the Cold War was won only when the West remembered that values and security cannot be separated. The values of freedom and democracy as much if not more than economic and military might won the Cold War. And those same values will lead us to victory in the war on terror. That is why President Bush's strong belief and his strategy rests on that pillar. America will fight and win the war on terror because freedom is defending, worth defending. And America will fight and win the war of ideas because truth is needed in freedom's defense. Thank you very much. Dr. Rice. Dr. Rice has um, agreed to entertain some questions that have been developed by the Wingate University Leadership Fellows. Hi, Dr. Rice. Hello. My name is Anna Miller and I'm from Hammond, Louisiana, and I'm a junior here studying psychology at Wingate. Um, the media plays such a dominant role in our lives. American citizens have been bombarded with opposing views of truth. And personally, I find it difficult to cut through the political rhetoric. How would you, as a senior advisor to the president, advise Americans to deal with the issue of knowing what to believe? Well, that's a very good question. And indeed, um, there sometimes is a media barrage, and there's so much information, and it seems that there's so much information and no way to get to the truth. I would suggest a couple of things. The first is, I always told my students at Stanford, that if you find yourself in the company of people who agree with you all the time, find other company. <laughs> and in many ways, the best way to test your ideas and to test your, what you're wondering about is to talk to other people who may have opposing views. You're learning here at Wingate to think critically to listen to an argument. And one of the most important things you can do is when you read a, a newspaper article, you can say to yourself, now, has the evidence that's been presented here actually made the argument, or is there just a lot of wordage here that really has nothing to do with the argument? So critical thinking about what you're reading is important. Secondly, it's important to, to have a wide range of uh, reading from a wide range of views. Uh, and the internet, which is, um, 
not always my favorite thing, but actually is, it turns out to be a good thing in this regard. The internet actually does provide you an opportunity to re read a wide range of views. And I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story about Russia this time around. The uh, television media was very closely controlled by the Russian government. And the television media was not showing what was really happening in that hostage crisis. And it led everybody to the internet and to small newspapers to get their information. Now, to a certain extent, you have to do the same thing. You have to get outside of the, just the traditional media and go to others. So use your critical thinking facilities, read the argument, say, does this really support what this person is saying? And most importantly, always be around people who can challenge and who you can challenge uh, about ideas. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Dr. Rice. Yes. My name is Christopher Hewitt. I'm a senior from Bridgeton, New Jersey. And as a four-year ROTC student with active duty uh, military service in my near future, I'd like to know uh, what changes you foresee in uh, the military and national security in the near future, uh, depending on the outcome of the November election. Thank you. Well, America is in a struggle, and first of all, thank you for the service that you're going to give to this country. Um, the, the most heartening thing on any given day. The most heartening thing that you can see on any given day is the dedication of our men and women in uniform. Because this is a volunteer army. These are people who are volunteering to defend us. And that's quite extraordinary, and Americans owe a great debt. Now, the president has laid out very clearly how he will fight the war on terrorism. It's his view that we're in a big struggle, a historic struggle, a struggle of, of historic proportions. Um, the American people will see different strategies for how to fight the war on terrorism. The president believes that the first thing that we have to do, of course, is we have to uh, take down the Al-Qaeda organization that plotted 9-11 and we're making a lot of progress. We've killed or captured three quarters of their leaders, uh, some of their best field generals, people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed who plotted 9-11 uh, was the mastermind. We're shrinking the territory on which they can operate and in fact if you just think about three years ago when the Taliban was in charge in Afghanistan, they're now gone. Three years ago when Pakistan was not really in the war on terrorism on our side they were supporting Taliban. Now Pakistan is fighting the Al-Qaeda all throughout Pakistan and Afghanistan. Now you have, of course, in Afghanistan a government that is actually fighting terrorism. We've made a lot of progress. But the big debate is really about whether it is just enough to try and deal with the, the symptom, which is Al-Qaeda, and it's spawn the organizations like al-qaeda or whether as i was just saying in the speech you have to get to the root causes this ideology of hatred and whether or not you have to really change the very nature of the middle east and this president believes that unless you change the nature of the middle east unless you give people freedom and liberty and again connect our values of freedom and liberty and our security we will never be able to defeat this ideology of hatred. And that's why Iraq is so important. When people say, well, Iraq was really a diversion. It really wasn't in the front line of the war on terrorism. Well, you know who understands that it was on the front line of the war on terrorism? It's the terrorists who are fighting in Iraq. Because they know that when there is a democratic, stable Iraqi government in the heart of the Middle East that can show that democracy can, in fact, take hold in the Middle East. And when the ideology of hatred is replaced by free men and women who have a future, that their ideology of hatred and their inevitability of victory as they see it will be given to lie. And it will, we will have won much as we won in the Cold War. And so what we do in Iraq matters. So this is, a, this is a tough struggle, it's a long struggle. Nothing of value is ever won without sacrifice. Uh, but America will be safer and more secure and we will live in a world where even the Middle East has uh, finally been brought into the community of free nations.
Good afternoon, Dr. Rice. My name is Courtney Luce, and I'm a junior elementary education major from Knoxville, Tennessee. My question for you is, please explain your role in the president's decision to go to war in Iraq. Yes. Well, thank you. The, the uh, National Security Advisor does really uh, three things for, for the president. The first is I staff the president. So uh, if he needs a paper on this or he's going to make a phone call here or I just make sure that it all gets done for him. Um, secondly, I help to coordinate the government and in that role during, uh, during the run up to the war it was important that the president have uh, the views of the key uh, secretaries and uh, that he had clear briefings from his, um, his military commanders and that we had a process where everybody could come together and consider what we needed to do um, in, a, in Iraq. And then finally, I, I act as kind of counselor to the president. So it's not my job, I don't consider it my job to um, try to impose my views on the president. I spend most of my time making sure he knows the views of others but also to help him think through his views, to say, well, Mr. President, have you thought about this, or here's the consequence of that. What was so extraordinary to me about this period of time was that the President was so certain about the importance of the spread of liberty and democracy and freedom and of dealing with threats before they fully materialized. But he was patient, he wanted to know what might happen, he went through so many different military plans. I'm sure Tommy Franks would tell you he just kept sending people back and saying we're not quite there yet because he wanted to understand the implications of what he was deciding and I tried, and tried to help him do that. But I will tell you that in the final analysis there's really only one person who makes that decision. It has got to be the loneliest spot in the world, you know, the presidency of the United States because it is really only the president who um, goes into his mind with his conscience and with his responsibilities and with his obligations to protect the American people and decides that it is time to respond to a particular threat. And um, I will never forget the day when it was clear that the president had made that decision and we were then sitting in the situation room with uh, the whole National Security Council war cabinet there and the commander's on the screen from the, um, from the region, and he said to each of them, do you have everything that you need? There were about seven commanders, uh, the component commanders, and he said to each one of them, do you have everything that you need? And they said, yes, sir. Do you have everything that you need? Yes, sir. And then he said, then we will have to do it. And he saluted them, and he left the room. And it was really one of the most dramatic moments that I have experienced because it's a lonely decision. But the wonderful thing about this president is having made that decision, he knows that it was the right strategic decision. When going gets tough, he doesn't waver. He doesn't decide, oh, maybe it should have been that or maybe it should have been that. He knows that he owes to the American people consistency and toughness and resolve. And he's got it in great measure. We're very fortunate to have him. Good afternoon, Dr. Rice. My name is Rachel Bleacher, and I'm a senior marketing major, and I'm from Wilmington, Delaware. My question for you today is, with the upcoming election in Iraq, what is your opinion on militants, such as al-Sadar, having a role in the new Iraqi government, and will this affect U.S. relations? Yes. It's a very good question. The Iraqis are indeed moving directly to elections. They'll have elections uh, for the first time in, in uh, January, probably, and then they will write a constitution and they'll move to permanent elections. The Iraqis will have to decide who can participate in their political process. And uh, there's one thing that I've really come to respect and understand about Prime Minister Alawi and the people around him. They know both the good and the bad about their society. And they know what compromises they need to make and they know what compromises would be dangerous. Uh, they have been um, very effective under extremely different, difficult circumstances of working with all the various elements of Iraqi society, tribal leaders, clerics, professional society, professional organizations, Shia and Sunni and Kurds, to keep everybody marching along the same path. And I'm sure they will make good decisions about participation in the election. 
The important thing for us is to stay steady with them. Uh, the young woman who asked about the press, if there's one thing that just drives me crazy right now, it's that every day, if things go well, then we swing this way. If things go badly, then we swing this way. And every day, it's all going to fall apart. Despite the fact that we know with big historical circumstances, things are turbulent and they go up and down and there will be bad days and good days. But as long as the strategic direction is toward elections and the Iraqi people finding their own voice in politics, they're doing the right thing and we're doing the right thing in supporting them. So the one thing that we have to do is to be more patient about how hard it is actually to get to democracy, particularly when you've been under tyranny for as long as these people have, they're doing remarkably well. And I try to remind Americans that after all, we had that unfortunate little experiment called the Articles Confederation before we finally got it right in 1789. Um, we, we should be a little bit more humble about what it takes to get to democracy and not assume every other day that they're going to fail. They're doing just fine. They're fighting a tough insurgency made up of people who don't want them to succeed, foreign terrorists who want to take the battle to Iraq because they feel they have to win there or they're going to lose the uh, entire war. And we have to be patient and steady with them. And uh, that's what the president's doing. Great, thank you. Thank you. My name is Christina Sayersina, and I'm a senior biology major from Buffalo, New York. And my question is, as national security advisor, what do you specifically think is the greatest threat to our country at this time? I think the greatest threat to our country at this time is um, this ideology of hatred that hates who we are. You know, it's one thing when you have policy differences with someone. Um, then maybe you can discuss it, maybe there's some room for bridging, um, even to a certain extent as the relationship went on with the Soviet Union, we would sometimes find areas on which we could cooperate, especially we found that we didn't want to blow each other to smithereens so we could find ways to cooperate on that. You just don't see it with this, with this movement. This is a movement that is out to destroy us. You know, on, on the day of September 11th, they didn't just seek to terrorize us, they sought to try to bring us down. That's why they went after the, the Twin Towers and after our economic well-being. That's why they went after the center of military power, the Pentagon. That's why they were going after either the Capitol or the White House. It was a political attack. That was an act of war. They intend to destroy us. And that means all-out war against them, using everything at our disposal to defeat them. And we have to defeat the ideology of hatred, too, and have a different kind of Middle East. And so I think that's the greatest threat. It will be multiplied many times over if they manage to get their hands on a weapon of mass destruction, biological or chemical or, heaven forbid, nuclear. And that's why the president has also been so um, active on the non-proliferation front in uh, dealing with North Korea, doing, dealing with Iran, taking down Saddam's regime that refused to account for his weapons of mass destruction, because the possible combination of September 11th with a, ma a weapon of mass murder is just something that we cannot, uh, cannot fathom. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have... Dr. Rice can take one more question. Hi, Dr. Rice. My name is Megan Odom. I'm from Lakeland, Florida. I'm a junior studying athletic training. Hmm. Uh, my question for you is how do you convince Americans that the terrorists are losing their war against the yeah. United States? Yes. Well, I, I do believe that uh, you have to, we have to be very straightforward with the American people that it's a long struggle that it's not a conventional war in which any time soon we can, accept, we can expect to sign a peace treaty um, at a table with flags behind us with, uh, with the terrorists. That, that day is not going to come. But we can point to the battles that we're winning uh, along the way. And I think that's the way for people to understand that there is progress. If you think about just the, what we've been through, and we have 
liberated 50 million people, the Taliban is no longer in power, Saddam Hussein is no longer in power, the Al-Qaeda has lost three quarters of their members and, uh, and leaders, uh, the um, Pakistanis are now resolute fighters in the war on terrorism where before they were actually supporting the Taliban, the Saudis are fighting terrorism. Every day when I sit down for the terrorism report, the information is coming from intelligence services all over the world, and law enforcement all over the world is helping us. We've done more to defend ourselves by port security and airport security and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, and we're making a lot of progress in what ultimately will win it for us, which is the spread of liberty and, and freedom into uh, the rest of the world. There's a, a very active debate for the first time in the Middle East and in the Arab world about freedom and liberty, where people are actually concerned about women's rights and freedom and liberty. These are important victories along the way. But you also have to say to the American people um, that this is going to require patience, it's going to require time. You know, the last time that I was in government, which was so nicely referenced, um, I, Mr. Pope, I was um, the Soviet specialist when the Cold War ended. It doesn't get much better than that, to be there when Germany's unified and Eastern Europe's liberated and the Soviet Union collapses. And you know, as a student of international politics, I never thought I would see any of those things, let alone actually have a chance to participate in them. But I thought back and I thought about the fact that we were actually just harvesting the good decisions that had been taken in 1945 and 1946 and 1947 and 1948. People like Atchison and Truman and, and the stalwarts in the Cold War, like the Senator and like Scoop Jackson of Washington and all the people who hung in there for all of those years. And I think back uh, some days when you know, things are not going so well in Afghanistan or they're not going so well in Iraq, and I wonder what it must have been like to be in the White House when in 1946 the communists in Italy and in France won respectively 48 and 46 percent of the parliamentary vote. When in 1947 there were civil wars in Turkey and Greece, when most Germans were still starving because the reconstruction had failed in 1947 and they had to launch the Marshall Plan. When in 1948 the Soviet Union set out to strangle Berlin and you had to have the Berlin airlift. When in 1949 the Soviet Union exploded a nuclear weapon five years ahead of schedule and the same year the Chinese Communist won the Chinese Civil War. And I think to myself, how must they have felt about the potential for the world to, to turn out the way it did in 1989 or 1990? It must have seemed very far-fetched. But you know what they did? They went back to core values. They built the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and they launched the Marshall Plan, and they recognized that if you got democracy in Germany, you were going to have a different kind of Europe. And if you got democracy in Japan, you were going to have a different kind of Asia. And they linked up their values and our security, and they produced a whole system that we st stayed steadfast with, with guarding it ourselves, until the Soviet Union finally collapsed. Now, that took patience. And it says to me that the American people do indeed have patience. And I know that just like now, when the president sits across from Chancellor Schroeder of Germany or Prime Minister Koizumi from Japan and is looking across at a leader who represents a democratic ally in places that many people thought democracy would never take hold, I know that one day, maybe 20 years from now or 30 years from now or 40 years from now, that an American president is going to sit across from the president of a free Iraq and from the Prime Minister of a, of a free Afghanistan, and people are going to say, you know, I'm really glad that they made the decisions that they did back in 2003 and 2004 to recognize that America is always more secure when freedom is on the march and far less secure when freedom is in retreat. That is what the war on terrorism is ultimately about. It's about creating a world that will be permanently better, not just temporarily. And that takes time, it takes sacrifice, but America is more than up to the task. Thank you very much.
over a thousand of our soldiers have died, over 7,000 have been maimed and wounded, and over 12,000 Iraqi men, women, and children have been killed. What gave us the right to go there? I think that the Republicans showed who they truly were at their convention. They displayed an honesty about their party and their political views, of what we stand for. We're going to be going into this, this war on terrorism. We're going to have to have support from from people all over the world. And, and uh, Bush just doesn't seem to have the diplomatic ability to reach out to the world. I do think that Kerry needs to focus more on his issues and give us a clear plan of what his plans are for the economy and creating jobs. Washington Journal. Call in and join the conversation on politics, public affairs, and current events. Live, mornings at 7 Eastern on C-SPAN.